Greetings, friends, and welcome back to the podcast of Jewish Ideas, a Torah in Motion podcast. I'm JJ Kimchi. Moshe Chaim Lutzato, often known by his acronym Ramchal, was one of the most extraordinary Jewish minds of the modern era, perhaps of any era. The Ramchal was a brilliant polymath, and in his relatively brief life, he made remarkable contributions in the fields of Hebrew literature, Kabbalah, philosophy, ethical literature, biblical exegesis, and much more. Since his death in 1746, he has been venerated by ideological streams across the Jewish world as a central pillar of their worldview. Yet, in his own lifetime, he was a highly controversial figure, subject to all kinds of persecutions and denunciations for his writings. Today, we shall delve into the life, the writings, and the ideas of this fascinating individual and attempt to gain a deeper understanding of the Ramchal's many, many layers of brilliance. Joining us today to discuss this is one of the world's foremost experts on the Ramchal, and on modern Kabbalah more generally. Professor Jonathan Garb, who is the Gershom Shalom Professor of Kabbalah in the Department of Jewish Thought at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Professor Garb has published numerous important works in his field and his groundbreaking biography of the Ramchal, Mukubal Balev HaSa'ara, Rabbi Moshe Chaim Lutzato, was published by Tel Aviv University Press in 2014. It is a pleasure to welcome him to the podcast of Jewish Ideas today. Professor Garb, welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Excellent. Um, so let's dive into uh, our our, um, our topic today. There's so much to cover, and uh, you know, I could spend many, many hours talking about the life and works of the Ramchal. Um, could you perhaps give us a brief overview of uh, the life and times of this individual? Yes. Well, since uh, Ramchal also was a playwright and composed uh, plays, so I think it would be interesting to divide his life into a few acts as if it was a play. Okay. So we have Act One, which is his early period in which he was um, supported, I would say, by a family business. He was able to dedicate himself to study, but study in two avenues. One is the more predictable avenue of Torah study, and was really a, like a wunderkind, a ilui, a prodigy. Um, at the age of 15, already had accumulated a, a substantial knowledge of the central corpus of modern Kabbalah, or of Lurianic Kabbalah, the writings of uh, Yitzhak Luria, whom I believe you discussed in a previous podcast at length, so I won't belabor that too much. Um, and also, uh, he had another track, which was exposure to, I would say, uh, general knowledge, in a sense you could say secular knowledge, of uh, what, what's called the trivium in, in, uh, uh, in what we used to be called in the Middle Ages, uh, basically things like grammar, logic, rhetoric, poetry, so he was also given a very strong literary training by experts in the field. And I think this combination is actually very uh, typical of Italian Jewry, this combination of Torah together with uh, literature and in some form of secular knowledge, one could say. Uh, and then we have uh, Act Two. So Act Two begins around the age of, um, I would say, 2022, 20, in which he becomes the nucleus of a Kabbalistic group, a Kabbalistic fellowship. In modern Kabbalah, it's very common to have these chavurot, these fellowships uh, of about 10 to 20 young Kabbalists who get together, study together, pray together, do various rituals and techniques. And he, I won't say exactly was the leader of a fellowship, it's a complicated story, but he, he certainly became a new part of a nucleus of a fellowship. And then... Around the age of 22, his life, uh, uh, so we're speaking about 1729, 1730, his life changes dramatically. He has a series of revelations from um, various uh, entities, one could say, uh, angels, souls of the illustrious departed. Uh, really, the great figures of Jewish history reveal themselves to him because in the Kabbalistic belief, of course, these these departed figures are not really departed, they're actually very present, but one has to access them through various uh, mystical techniques. And then he's imparted these revelations, and for a while he, he keeps it under wraps, until around 1730 when it begins to enter the public view. And this happens uh, um, around 1730, and it opens the Act 3 in, uh, in his life. So if Act was characterized, I would say, by a very strong sense of mystical achievement, that he has all these revelations and that give him a very strong sense of destiny, even a messianic destiny. He's given a very important role in human history by these entities. They dictate to him all these texts that he writes with great rapidity and has begins to compose uh, um, a whole complete new genre of, of, of Kabbalistic writing. So a period of creativity and of... Uh, um, 
I would say, uh, encouragement from above, so to speak, in his experience. However, this backfires because one of his students, uh, the, the, nucle- the fellowship was really composed of a group of students, of university students, because the University of Padua in North Italy, in the Veneto area, in the area, rough area of Venice, one could say, in northeastern Italy, we had a situation in which the university for quite a while had been open to Jewish students in a rare manner. And Jewish students came to take the traditional Jewish uh, occupations of law and medicine. And uh, actually, Ramchal himself started a degree, but he didn't finish it, because as I said, he had family money, he didn't really need it in a sense. And one of his students was what we call a foreign exchange student who came from Vilna, the uh, Bukutiel Gordon, also a very creative and, and uh, learned figure. And the Bukutiel Gordon, uh, right in home, so to speak, exposes uh, with great enthusiasm these uh, revelations. And then be, this letter becomes uh, viral, as we would say today. It becomes a circuit letter, and it reaches the attention of uh, the authorities, the Jewish authorities, rabbinical authorities. Now, one has to remember that this is a very charged period, because we're speaking about 60 years after the whole messianic episode of Shabtai Tzvi, the mystical messiah, as Gershom Sholem, who you mentioned before, the founder of our field in a real sense, uh, described as a mystical messiah, and Shabtai Tzvi really led the Jewish world into a failed adventure of messianism and ends up converting to Islam, and the whole messianic, revelatory, mystical even, element in Judaism becomes very suspect. And for a variety of reasons we can discuss later, um, basically there's a whole, one could say in harsh language, inquisition, or we could say in a softer language, inquiry launched against Ramchal, which we have. We have the, the, the precedence of this inquiry, the, the file, so to speak, the Lutzato file. And Ramchal is really under suspicion, um, one could say on, on a trans-European level, that is various people from art Europe become involved in this discussion. There's people who are really proven experts as sort of witch hunters of the Sabbatean heresy. And they begin to cast their gaze on Ramchal and train their, their tar- target him, in a sense. And at the same time, there's this rivalry between Padua and Venice, which is a long-time rivalry, and the rabbinical authorities of Venice also are not so happy with him and see him as a sort of upstart. And one could say that Act 3 is really the whole period of um, inquiry, suspicion, letters going backwards and forwards, uh, attack and defense, one could say, until there's a sort of ceasefire declared, a sort of truce, and uh, he limits his Kabbalistic activity in various ways. He, he gets off his whole revelatory track. He, be, he still does Kabbalah, but in a more moderate way, in a more conventional way. And then he has a few years of quiet in Italy, in which he composes major books, in, also in Kabbalah, um, which are very important uh, in, in a more exegetical mode. And then he, towards the end of his period, he wants to go to Amsterdam for family business. Amsterdam was a big uh, center of trade. And the suspicion is that Amsterdam was also a very uh, important print center at the time. And he wants to print his Kabbalistic books and in a way evade the restrictions placed on him by the authorities by leaving Italy. And then he's arrested on the way to, one could say, on the way to Amsterdam, Frankfurt am Main. And he basically is interrogated and his writings are seized and he's placed under excommunication and this act of persecution ends in a very sad note that his Kabbalistic activity is very severely restricted, his whole fellowship is disbanded. But then we have Act 4 in which he does get reach Amsterdam, he's received with respect by the community, he found he finds a, a means of employment and he writes, because he can't write Kabbalah, he writes a whole series of books that greatly benefit us not only in the mode which you, which you wrote before, like plays and uh, rhetoric and logic and Talmudics, uh, legal discussions, but also, law, I would say, books of what we would call today Jewish thought, that is, books that explain the principles of the Jewish religion in non-Kabbalistic language, because you can't write in Kabbalistic language. And it's of great benefit to us that we have in very clear language in wonderful Hebrew that, I would say, modern Hebrew, that any capable Hebrew reader can very easily read his books, and uh, he has this whole period in, in, I would say, of calm and creativity in Amsterdam. And also a very important book of what's called Musar. It's usually translated of ethics. I would call it self-improvement. Mesilati Sharim, The Path of the Just, which is very well received, uh, printed in Amsterdam. And that's really, uh, is in a way, refashioned himself as a much broader figure than a Kabbalist, Kabbalist and Messianic figure. However, because he has this 
desire to ultimately return to Kabbalah and to Kabbalistic writing. Act five, he moves to what was then Ottoman Palestine, to Galilee, to the north of what of today's Israel. And he has a, a period there which is not clear. I mean, you mentioned the date 1746, which is certainly an accepted date. That's the conventional date given, yeah. Yeah, a conventional date, give or take, as they say, a couple of years. But the, the Act five really ends quite sadly, in which he he dies of plague, which there were waves of plague then in the, the north of Israel, in the whole area of really of the Near East. And um, seemingly his whole family dies with him, but actually not really, because apparently one of his family members still preserves his last book in Kabbalah. And we see that when he, he moves to the Galilee, he, he returns to Kabbalistic writing and really reinvents himself again. So really we've got a figure who reinvents himself more than once, which makes him, of course, a very fascinating topic of a play. There have been plays quite recently actually uh, made about Luzzato's life, and rightly so. Interesting. Um, yes, interestingly for a playwright himself. I'm, I'm just curious, before we get on to the ideas of the books, I mean, of his accusations that he, you know, harbored messianic pretensions and, and you know, maybe even some sort of crypto sabbatean to, to what extent was there validity, in your opinion, in any of these accusations? Well, as they say, the jury is still out on this one, in the sense that... Uh, 250 years later, the jury is still out, yes. There's yes. It's a, a long-sitting jury. Exactly, yes, a long jury duty. He is still... It's still debatable. Uh, my, I, I generally, uh, follow in many great thinkers, I, I, I like the middle path. In a sense that we, one extreme would be to say, yes, he was part of a post sabbatean uh, uh, phase and he was a closet Sabbatean and a messianic figure in Sabbatean mode, just like Shabtai Tzvi thought he was a messiah. So either he thought that he was a messiah or Shabtai Tzvi was the preparatory messiah and he's the fulfillment messiah and so on and so forth, and maybe even engaged the devil in magic, and one can throw all kinds of things on, into this uh, stew. However, uh, the other extreme is, I would say, orthodox apologetics, uh, of saying, no, he was, of course, uh, there's all false accusations. Somehow, all the leading rabbis of Europe, or the great majority of them, and even beyond Europe, uh, all ganged up on him, and uh, all made this huge mistake in thinking that he was a Sabbatean because of the atmosphere of the times, but actually was completely blameless, um, and of course, that's, a, that's another extreme. And I think the, the, the middle path is that he certainly had messianic uh, self-image. Uh, but at a certain stage, may, stage, maybe he felt that it was uh, uh, blocked from above, just like it came from above. It was blocked from above. And it's a story you can go into, maybe. A very interesting story, if it's true, about how the messianic, at its height, the messianic uh, impetus was blocked. And uh, we certainly see that at a certain stage, the whole fellowship moves away to a large extent from this messianic discourse. And as for Sabbatianism, I don't think he had high regard for Shabtai Tzvi, but Shabtai Tzvi had a prophet, yes, just like uh, in other movements, he had a, a prophetic figure, Natan of Aza, Rabbi Natan, as Ramchal calls himself, Rabbi Natan. And uh, Rabbi Natan is one of the great Kabbalists of all times, a very creative figure, very creative writer, whose writings of quite recently uh, are being published, uh, not all of them, but the main ones, and a very novel interpretation of, of uh, Luriani's doctrine of modern Kabbalah. And Ramchal, as his own one of his own teachers pointed out, he basically accepts the, uh, this interpretation, it's just he doesn't take it in the Sabbatian direction, probably because he saw himself as a messianic figure, and Shabtai Tzvi is a failed messiah. But he certainly was influenced by the writings of Natan, which makes him, in a, in a wider sense, part of the Sabbatean uh, creativity, which Gershom Sholem, it was perhaps Gershom Sholem's most devoted project uh, in the, the Kabbalah scholarship. Okay, this is fascinating. I mean, you already alluded to one of the most extraordinary aspects of the Ramchal's life, which was the sheer diversity of uh, of the kinds of writings he produced, the sheer massive array of genres in which he produces works. So you you mentioned you know um, elements of his Kabbalah and elements of his uh, ethical Musar literature um, and uh, and his plays and uh, you know his his uh, introduction to, to to the Talmud and his commentaries on books of the Bible and all sorts of things that he uh, he puts out there. So so I want to ask, I mean, you know, is there a unified Ramchal that you can see throughout all these works? Um, in the sense that, you know, all of these are very different. And, you know, those of us who've picked up some of these books, I mean, they're, they're extraordinary. Um, and as you say, written with a beautiful, luminous clarity of, of, of Hebrew uh, writing. Um, but is there a golden thread that can be discerned through many of his writings? Um, and especially one of the reasons I want to ask you this is because one of the things you do in your book is uh, claim that several of the 
pieces of writing that people think is uh, is authored by the Ramchal, in fact, has not. Um, so can you discern a definite Ramchalian, you know, style of authorship, let's say, or or, or, um, or concerns that he was, you know, he focused on um, that run through everything he wrote? Well, uh, I think that uh, after having done what you alluded to, the philological groundwork of isolating the core writings of Ramchal, because he is such a popular figure, there's a sort of desire, because some of his writings were indeed lost. So there's a desire to recover his, his writings and to attribute to him all kinds of works that actually he didn't write, but were written probably by students, so it's not a huge difference. But he, he's got a trademark in which is easily identifiable. And uh, the trademark is, besides what we already discussed, his, the, the, the beauty and the clarity of his writing, is the tremendous construction, the tremendously crafted and careful construction of his writing. It's in a sense that when he writes, let's say, on page 40 or something, He's already thinking of page 100, and he's already deploying certain terms and certain phrases because these are the, like in Chekhov's image, this is the, the pistol hanging in the first act, again, to use a fiat image, which will shoot later on, so which will fire later on. So, And it's not just a question of, of the care of his construction, but also I think this is a, the, the principle of his writing, is, is order. Because at his time, Jewish writing was simply a morass, of a swampland, really, of all kinds of convolutions and uh, uh, endless exegesis and endless um, scholastics and so on, whether we're speaking about Kabbalah and the interpretation of the very difficult writings of Luria and all the sprawl of interpretations that is created, not to mention the editing itself, which is very sprawling. And we have this um, literary sprawl also in the Talmud and all the Talmudics going on, and in other areas as well, in, in, in legal discussions, uh, even though there was a code of law, but then the interpretations of the code of law also, one can find just tens of pages about one minute detail of law in the Shulchan Aruch and the code of law. So I, there's, there's a sense that one gets lost in it, and he reflects the sense in his writings, and he says, I, what I want to do here is to focus on principle and to, in each subject, find the, the principles and the organizing structure. And he says that he had a... a it was the age of, of botanical gardens. And he says, this is, which we still have, yes, uh, from this period and in Europe. And he, he says, it's like a well-ordered, this is the way we used to construct them, one can still see it today, a well-ordered garden. Instead of having a garden of all kinds of weeds and wild flowers, we have a garden with organized paths and organized uh, trails and so on and so forth, in which uh, one can easily find oneself. Another image used is, is a maze. So instead of being in a maze, we we in this garden. Uh, and in this well-crafted garden, one can finally organize Jewish knowledge and make it accessible and make it assimilable uh, and graspable in an easy manner. And that's why he writes a lot in a didactic mode, in a mode of, of methodology, one could say. And the second principle here, which is that he writes in one place, everything is easy for someone who doesn't study in depth. That is, one reaction to this whole mass of Jewish writing is just to cover it uh, superficially, just to uh, cover ground, so to speak. It's very common, like we have today, what they call the daf yumi, to study a page of Talmud a day. So unless one's a full-time Torah scholar in the half an hour or 10 minutes on the on web, on podcasts, or, or even an hour, it's very hard to, to really cover a page of Talmud thoroughly and to really savor it, so to speak. And this is a, a fashion which even then existed, not just today. Of course, today it's become much stronger uh, in our uh, impatient times. So... Uh, Lutzato says, what I want to promote, not only him, but also other members of his fellowship, is a yun, study in depth. And we find a very, very great uh, uh, precision in his writing, and uh, really to a level of analytics, that one, which is rare, I'm not saying it's unprecedented, but it's rare. And he brings to this whole Lurianic mythic writing, prophetic kind of writing, analytic mode. And this is something I would one could recommend for the study of Luzzato is really to study Luzzato in depth, is to really focus. If he says two words, they're not they're not synonyms. If he's if he's saying it will become clarified, it will become true. There's a reason why he uses these two phrases and not two other phrases. And if one follows him word by word, then we can really appreciate the beauty of his writing. Interesting. And do you attribute at least some of this clarity and some of this uh, structure to his training in, let's say, rhetoric or any of the other disciplines that would have been common in, in, a, in a thorough sort of enlightenment Italian education? Yeah, I think so. I think his early training was an important factor here. Uh, his training in logic, in rhetoric, in grammar, in poetry even, 
this contributed not only to the beauty of his language, the almost poetical beauty of his style, but also to his organization and his very when 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 he reads his writings and rhetorics, we see that he practiced what he what he wrote. That he, he practiced he practiced, practiced he put into practice the same principles of rhetoric that he developed. I, I would really recommend for the study of Luzzato um, to follow his own rhetor- rhetorical construction to pay attention to rhetoric because he really practiced what he preached. When you read his writings and rhetoric, we see certain rhetorical principles that he himself puts into practice throughout his writing. And I think you're completely right that his early training in grammar, in logic, in rhetoric, in poetry developed not only the beauty of his style, but also the very careful construction and the and the persuasive power of his writing, which is part of his later massive later reception. Um, I'd like to move on a little bit to the content of, of some of his work and, and to ask the most, I suppose, basic question, because as you mentioned, large portions of his life was dedicated to the study of Kabbalah and to writing on Kabbalah. This might be an unfair question, but on one foot, could you perhaps provide us with what was the Ramchal's, firstly, his his, his interest, what, what areas of interest in Kabbalah was, was he focusing on? Also, what was his contribution? Um, I think in your book, you you state that he provides the nimshal to, to the Kabbalah of the Arizal. Um, in other words, he provides the key to the analogy used by by the, the Kabbalah of, of Yitzhak Luria um, a century earlier. And, you know, what, what do you mean by that? What was the Ramchal's principal contribution to this? Well, Ramchal, really, in terms of what he studied, he, he was devoted to two uh, corpuses. One is the Zohar, the classic of medieval Kabbalah, the Book of Radiance, uh, or the Books of Radiance, one should say more properly. And in the, here... Uh, he actually, imitation was the sincerest form of flattery, is that he wrote in the language, in the, the pseudo Aramaic or Zoharic Aramaic of the Zohar, and, uh, and tried, in a sense, to create a new Zohar, as he put it, as part of his Christianic project. And these are the one of the things that this presumption was criticized by his critics. And at some point, he was forbidden from writing in this mode, so he shifted to interpreting the Zohar. Um, now, the, the parts of the Zohar that interested him especially were those that were also of interest for Isaac Luria, and the, the focus, his focus was to continue, and again, in a somewhat ambitious manner, which of course also aroused some ire, uh, was to say that uh, he basically continues the light of Luria that was hidden. So we've got the Lurianic light, which was in some way blocked, and he's creating a new light from above and taking Luria much further, in a sense. And the much further is, is the direction that you indicated, that in, rather than seeing, we have in Luria this whole mythical and anthropomorphical language, and he wants to turn it into something which is more, it's been wrongly described as philosophical, but it, that's the right direction, even though it's wrong. I don't think he was ma- a philosopher, but he certainly saw Luria as, as writing as a, me- a metaphor for something. And for him, the metaphor was, this is not a movie that he invented, it's part of a general move in Italian Kabbalah, but he certainly perfected this move. And Luria is a metaphor for the course of history, but not the course of history, even though there were people in his circle who were interested in what's happening in Turkey and what's happening in France and what's happening even in America, in the colonies. But he, he was actually interested more in, um, I would say, divine history. How God leads us through, through history, especially the Jewish people, but all of humanity in a sense, from the creation through revelation, through destruction and exile to redemption. And here his main move was to ask a question which uh, is not asked in the Bible and is rarely asked in the Talmud, and which Maimonides, the great medieval thinker, dismissed as a non-question. The question of why the universe was created in the first place, why human beings were placed here in the first place. This is obviously an existential question which was of great import for him. The Tachlit as he put it. Yes, the purpose of creation, exactly, the purpose of creation. And he, his answer is a complex answer, but it's a dialectical answer. That we see that his dialectic comes into play here. That he says that basically God basically wants to give of himself. God, as, as the good, as the ultimate good, wants to share his goodness and by revealing himself. But the only way that God can reveal himself as something which is ultimately ungraspable is via negativa, is through, uh, uh, through negation. Uh, by revealing his control of history and through negating the, the sense that God is not in control of history, which is basically the reign of evil. And by through this um, process, which is ultimately the messianic process, because what is the Messiah? The Messiah is simply the revelation of God's supreme control over history through the messianic kingdom. And this process will enable us to show in God's good. But the problem is psychologically that uh, there's no free lunch. 
in a sense that one has to own, one has to own and acquire good and not just receive it passively. Because if one receives it passively, one feels the sense of indebtedness and the still uh, sense of uh, unworthiness, so to speak. So really God created history so that we can become part of this project, that by assisting God in the conduct of history and assisting this project of the divine revelation through negation and through combating evil inside ourselves psychologically and in history uh, through exile, then one can merit God's good and become really uh, the owner of this good rather than just uh, uh, getting a, a hand, hand down, so to speak. Interesting. And um, this, I, uh, I believe, ties into his, his theory of the problem of evil. Yes. In other words, uh, you, if good is only worth acquiring, or sorry, if the only good worth having is that worth acquiring through difficulty and hard work, then it stands to reason that a universe in which good may be acquired in this way must present challenge or challenges and obstacles, must be a place where good is actually difficult to acquire. Interesting. I, I just wanted to ask, I mean, you know, you, you say he, he read history in this manner. Did he ever try and and um, and sort of specify in this way because you know we have great histories that had been written you know, in previous centuries. Yeah, Azari de Rossi's Maore Naim, for instance, that was written in Italy a couple of centuries earlier, which is you know a stunningly detailed outline of, of Jewish history. Again, in this kind of historiosophical sense, in the sense of you're know, trying to attribute meaning or trying to attribute divine causation to various elements of Jewish history. I mean, as far as I know, the Ramchal didn't write any history himself, but did he ever? You know, were there certain events or certain processes which he outlined as ah, this what is happening in here is God's way of doing X or God's way of, of leading us towards towards this or that different uh, purpose? Well, on the whole, not so much. I mean, he had a, a very close colleague, perhaps his teacher, in some at some point, uh, Moshe David Valley, Valley, who really uh, wrote much more, as I said, about things like America and the Turkish Empire and uh, so on and so forth, and uh, to tobacco consumption, all kinds of economic history, all kinds of things. He was very involved in details of history, all of a Kabbalistic explanation. Uh, Ramchal himself, much less so, because his interest of his interest in principles rather than details, he was focused on key moments of history, the creation, the sin of Adam, the exile in Egypt, the revelation in Sinai, the first temple, the second temple, the exile, the Messiah, sort of highlights. However, we have his letters. Part of the, the Lutzato file is all the correspondence. And in the correspondence, from time to time, people uh, sort of, uh, out of the curiosity, they ask him, so how do you explain the fact that the Talmud was burnt uh, in Italy by the Christian authorities? And so on? he says, yes, this is because of X, Y, Z, of some Kabbalistic, uh, uh, it's a sort of minor, minor turn in this whole great game of history. Uh, it's a sort of one innings in this whole thing. Uh, so, so sometimes he, he does... Uh, uh, sort of uh, delivers some kind of explanation, but I don't think that was his fault in any way. He had somebody right next to him who was doing it uh, at far, with far more intensity. And with great knowledge, Valle had a tremendous knowledge of current events, of church history, of Catholic history, of all kinds of things. Uh, that's very interesting. Um, and so, I mean, there are some who have, uh, as, as we said, and we'll, we'll get onto this a bit later, of um, different streams of Jewish history after the Ramchal claiming him as their own. And one of them, of course, is the stream of religious Zionism. Uh, you know, Rav Kook, uh, the Rav Hanazir, um, others have really, you know, centralized Ramchal in their own writings. Was this part of it? I mean, I assume that Ramchal's close attention to history as revealing the divine um, I don't know, plan or, or the manner in which the Sod Hanaga, as you put it, the, the manner in which God um, leads humanity and leads the world through its various uh, epochs. Can he justifiably be seen as a forerunner to a kind of religious Zionism, let's say? Well, one of the things that we always in, on God for with scholarship is anachronism. So it's a problem to in, at times to interpret earlier developments on the basis of later developments. However, of course, here we have a case of reception. That is, within religious Zionism, we have two streams. We have a far more pragmatic stream, which is more or less extinct these days. Uh, people like the Rav Reines, then afterwards the Rav Maimon and so on. Uh, and today's schools and streets are called after them, and that's more or less it. Um, the other school, which is ultimately the victor in this internal context, is that of, the, as you mentioned, of Cook, the messianic, one could say, mystical stream, and uh, very much developed. Now, Rav Cook, I would say that Rav Cook himself is a very wide figure. He's also a polymath like Ramchal, maybe not of the same general knowledge, perhaps, but in terms of his, uh, he was far, far, far more of a Talmudist than Alachist than Ramchal for a start, and he actually he had a public uh, role and authority as chief rabbi, the first Ashkenazi or non, uh, non-Sephardic chief rabbi of Palestine, uh, of the mandatory Palestine in time of the British mandate. 
So Rav Kuk had, in some ways, even a wider life than, than Ramchal, also a long, longer life, not terribly long-lived, but, uh, but more than Ramchal. So, uh, and Rav Kuk was certainly influenced by Ramchal, there's no doubt about it. Uh, we have commentaries that was re- recently published, commentaries of his on Ramchal's Kabbalistic works. However, it was a student, uh, less known student, because he was less uh, political, ideological, uh, Rabbi David Cohen, the Nazarite, who had Nazarite vows, etc., as we can see, a mystical figure who really emulated Ramchal's aspiration to receive revelations and really delved into his writings in far greater intensity. And he developed this, this, doc, this Cookian doctrine. And of course, the Rabbi Cook exactly saw history very much like Ramchal. That is, it's a, it's a process which is leading towards revelation through dialectic, through negation, in this case, the dialectic of a deeper religiosity through secularization, which is, of course, not something which Ramchal would have dreamt of at the time, because unlike certain scholars, I don't think that he was in the midst of secularization in Italy in the early 18th century. No, but he would have seen maybe the earliest uh, stirrings of it, let's say. Yeah, yeah, very earliest. In a sense, he writes, he writes about it. He says about some of his students, uh, his students were university students, and they, they led student lives, they went to plays, they, they created plays and so on. And he says that what to his... Uh, uh, Antagonists, he says, look, what I'm doing is, is a project of returning them to, into the fold. These people who were leading these students' life are now Kabbalists. So, he's, so he, does, he does, I wouldn't call it secularization, but he's certainly contending with uh, a certain uh, weakening of religious intensity among Jewish, young Jewish students, which he wants to address. That's part of his project. So in that sense, I think we, there is a slight similarity to Rabbi Cook's far more developed theory of secularization. Of course, Rabbi Cook, unlike Ramchal, had a positive view of secularization because he said that secular Zionism, ultimately the fact that Zionism, despite its religious origins, succeeded on a secular basis is part of a divine plan. But the big difference between Rav Cook and Rav Nazir and other people in that circle until today and Ramchal is that they, they are speaking about specific historical events. In that play, sense, they're much closer to Rav Valle, except that they don't know Rav Valle's writings because they were only published in recent years and were not published in religious Zionist circles. Partly because Rav Valle's writings are far less uh, organized, in a sense, they're far more exegetical. They return to the same sprawl that Ramchal was trying to to counteract, uh, in a sense, uh, and uh, therefore they're less assimilable to a, a doctrine. Because in in the yeshiva Rabbi Cook founded, for instance, Ramchal's path of the path of the just, this was required reading um, at a very early early stage in the curriculum. So. It, Therefore, they, they took Ramchal's writings because A, they were available and free, B, far more digestible. But ironically, the, the doctrine is actually closer to that of Ravali in a sense of attention to historical detail, which very much increases in, in the Rav Cook circle. We can have things that a certain non-confidence vote in the government in 1974 all becomes interpreted as part of a divine plan at that level of de- resolution of detail. Of course, always retroactively. In a sense, in a sense, yes. Um, so, I mean, a couple of things. Firstly, the thing you mentioned earlier is actually one of the most fascinating you know parts of the Ramchal's biography which is that in his early life when he was you know the 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 center of this this hug of of Kabbalistic learning and of mystical visions uh, etc what is often forgotten is that his fellow travelers in that uh, particular fellowship were as you say were university students were people who were studying medicine and studying law and then you know and um, and as you say it, uh, putting it lightly engaging in the full spectrum of university student activities, uh, one might say, which, which is not quite what one imagines Ramchal doing early in his life, being kind of, uh, uh, to put it crudely, a sort of Hillel rabbi. Um, uh, it's not quite the vision one, one musters up. Um, I, I want to ask on, on um, an element that you touched on before, but perhaps to expand a little bit, which is on the psychological aspect of uh, Ramchal's Kabbalah and Kabbalistic writing, because you mentioned his, the histori- historiosophic, as, as you put it, uh, element of it, of, of interpreting history and seeing history as, as the main uh, platform or the, or the main um, forum in which God's hand or God's, um, you know, Sota Hanaga, his manner of leading may be visible. Um, but you also mentioned the psychological aspect of it. Perhaps you could expand a little. Well, it's interesting that just like Ramchal interpreted uh, Lurianic Kabbalah as an allegor- allegory or metaphor for, uh, histo- for history, for historiosophy, the Hasidim in 18th century Europe, a, generation, a couple of generations later, beginning a couple of generations later, interpreted it as a, a metaphor for psychology, for human psychology, religious psychology, of course. 
And Rabbi Chal was a controversial figure also in the Hasidic world. There were some Hasidic writers and, and thinkers who really adopted him and espoused him, and some who said well, one shouldn't read him, or, or, or sometimes it was works attributed to Ramchal, but it doesn't really matter. They didn't like the general direction. For instance, in Chabad, Ramchal's writings are found until this day. So I would say that the Hasidim are one who specialized in psychology, and Rav Kook actually also has a very interest in religious psychology, which is sometimes forgotten because of the interest in the more historical and national aspects of his thought. But Ramchal also was a master psychologist. We see it in The Path of the Just, which is not a Kabbalistic work. It's a work of self-improvement in a classical mode. However, one sees very detailed Kabbalistic uh, uh, psychological sketches of personality types, of how anger works, how pride works, and so on and so forth, how fear works. And we see it in his plays as well. We see a very keen attention to psychological elements. And of course, in Rabbi Vali's writing, Vali's writings on, on Proverbs and books in the Bible, which are more psychological, one also finds it very much. So I think there was already a strong interest in psychology, which in some way sets the stage for Hasidism, and which is part of a modern interest in the individual, in the psychology. It's part of Ramachal's idea that not only we have this messianic project, but each individual has a messianic project. And not only him, uh, who has a messianic role, or, or Vali, who also maybe has a greater messianic role, according to Ramachal's views or certainly according to Ravali's views. But uh, people like Kutiel Gordon and other people in his circle, each one has a certain project, has a certain task, of which is related to the correction of a soul. That is, people, the Lurianic idea, Isaac Lurie was a specialist in looking at people's forehead or something and telling them what are the things that they have to fix for the soul from previous reincarnations and so on and so forth. And Ramchal also developed this idea, but one's personal... Uh, rectification is part of this wider messianic project and wider historical project. So psychology, in a way, is at the, at the service of history. I see. Interesting. So so let's use this transition, as you mentioned, to move on to his his major work, or at least the work that has had by far the most impact and, and has endured very much to the day, which is Misilati Sharim, which you have uh, translated as the, as the path of the just. I mean, let's, let's uh, just basically, I mean, what is the content and the purpose of the book? What genre is it best to put it into? Um, and also uh, perhaps talk a little bit about the history of the writing, because it seems, uh, as we've discovered from manuscripts recently, he actually wrote two versions of it, a dialogical version and a thematic version. So g- give us your overview of what, how the book was written, what it is, and how we should conceive of it. Well, first of all, uh, it was written, as we said, in, in uh, I think it was Act 4 of his life in Amsterdam, and part of the prohibition to write Kabbalah. But it doesn't mean that he wrote a disguised Kabbalistic book, as some people think. I don't think that's the case. He already wrote a Kabbalistic book, and so he returned to it later when he came to the Galilee. But at this point, he, he was branching out, and he wrote other, in other genres. And he wrote a book of Musa, which, uh, as I said, has been translated as ethics, but the best way of putting it is self-improvement. And, and one of the nice things about having students is that uh, they develop certain things more than I've done. And my student, Patrick Koch of Hamburg University, has written a lot about Musa and about what Musa is and how it was conceived in the Jewish world. And he, he really sees it as part of a path, which is a very old path, and not just in, in Kabbalah, but in, in philosophy, in, in the West in general, and maybe in other cultures as well, but that's beyond our purview at the moment, um, which is the idea of, of the progress of self-improvement, that would actually work on oneself like a work of art. One of the great writers on, on this topic, Michel Foucault, wrote about it like that. One can transform oneself into a work of art, so to speak. And this is a very old tradition. And part of the self-improvement is that one can follow, again, Ramchal, because he looks for order and he looks for principles. He's, he says, where can we find something which gives us the ladders on this, this ascent, the rungs on the ladder, so to speak, uh, the various stages that lead to, to perfection? Because, again, to, to reach perfection is ultimately to enjoy God's goodness. But one has to reach that perfection and one has to combat evil, as we said, inside oneself, the evil impulse and the forces of negativity inside oneself. So tie, in a way, it does tie into his wider doctrine of evil and of, of perfection and of divine revelation, but not through the Kabbalistic language. So he found a Talmudic passage which really sets out the stages that the, one has care and then uh, um, one has uh, uh, elasticity or, or energy and then one has... Uh, um, uh, gr- grace, uh, and then one has uh, ultimately the Holy Spirit. There, there's, there's various stages of mystical development, which or of internal development, one could say, I wouldn't say exactly mystical, because the Talmud uh, has mystical elements, but it's not a mystical book or, or corpus. And it's, it's interesting to compare these, the very similar letters that one can find in the Islamic world, in the Buddhist world, but as I said, it's a bit beyond our scope for the moment. But 
this is a general phenomenon in mystical, in mystical culture that one finds stages in a path that lead towards perfection, the, the stages of perfection, so to speak. There's a whole literature, not just in the Jewish world. And of course, this Talmudic passage was commented on in, in Sfat and in other places, as Patrick has shown uh, at length. And for Ramchal, uh, basically, what he, he uses is as a platform to, to impose organization on this whole area of self-development. Because when he, what he says is people, a bit like today in the spiritual supermarket, he says people just sort of take things at random. They, they take something which looks nice to them to say a lot of psalms or to roll around in the snow or kind of ascetic practices or, or maybe to get very deeply into one passage of Talmud and uh, to get up at midnight. They, they take all kinds of practices at random. The Jewish world was flooded with these practices at the time. But he says, no, one has to do things, in, again, in, in an organized way, in an analytical manner, to look carefully at one's soul, to do soul searching. And he said, just like he uses the image because of his business life, he says, just like merchants do the tally and they do the bottom line and they do their accounts, one has to do this accounting of the soul, this recognition of the soul, Cheshbon Nefesh. Now, this is, this is just like the psychology moves into Hasidism, the history moves into Rav Kook, so there's another stream in modern Judaism, which I myself was trained in, that of Musar, of modern Musar, the movement founded in the 19th century in Lithuania by Rabbi Israel Salanto, and uh, which is still with us in some way. It's become much weakened, but it's still around. And Ramchal, the Mesilati Shirim, was, of course, the, maybe the core text for this movement, because that's exactly what they wanted to do. They wanted to impose a sort of discipline and order and in-depth analysis in what was before a haphazard collection of uh, good meaning practices and uh, uh, exuberances. So if this is what you're saying, is that the Ramchal's popularity, let's say, or, or the widespread Masilati Sharim, is based on the manner in which he systematizes all the disparate elements before him. And, and I suppose that his clarity of thought and, and, and all the other, you know, the, the um, purpose of structure that you mentioned before. Um, but, and, and this is very interesting. I mean, this is interesting, the popularity and the widespread nature of the Masilati Sharim, precisely because for so many years, especially during his own life, the Ramchal was such a contested and such a... Um, a controversial figure. And this is something interesting because in many religious circles nowadays, you wouldn't find any hint of this. I mean, many people who studied Misilati Sharim or Derek Hashem or others have actually no idea that this was, you know, such a contested author. And my question then becomes, you know, how did this process of, so to speak, cushering the Ramchal take place? So you have someone in his own life who was incredibly, uh, you know, fought over, Shanu uh, Bamachloket, you might say. Um, and then in the decades or centuries following his death, he becomes, you know, an absolute core, an absolute staple of the mainstream uh, Litvish, you know, Musar-oriented education um, and, and an absolutely undisputed canonical figure. And what did that process look like? How did that happen? Who was responsible for it? I I'm just curious how that process took place. Yes, well, uh, it's very interesting. I mean, the late Shaya Leibovich said that uh, since the Code of Law, since the Shulchan Aruch, there's only been one book that is, has such universal acceptance, mm -hmm. Zionist, non-Zionist. Hasidim, non-Hasidim, Ashkenazic, Sephardic, women also study with Mr. Shreem, even in Orthodox, very Orthodox circles. Uh, young people, older people, also given at high school level. So that's true. I mean, Mr. Shreem, unlike Ramchal, is universal acceptance. Ramchal is near universal acceptance. It's still here and there one can hear like these very minor voices of dissent about Ramchal's Kabbalistic project. It still exists, but... Uh, and de facto, in the Sephardic world, they don't really go into Ramchal's writings, as somebody once, one of the Sephardic companies said to me, we're not against it, but we're not especially for it. So uh, it's not our project, in a sense. Uh, we went on a different tangent, but we, we won't go even to, into that because we don't, can't cover all the streams of modern Kabbalah, which is very diverse. And the Masilat Yishirim was part, this has already been pointed out by others, uh, I'm just repeating really, uh, that... Uh, the Ramchal's rehabilitation was partly to do with Misilat Yisharim. That is, one of his great foes, one of the great Sabbatian witch hunters, he says, he read, he read Misilat Yisharim, and, and he says, sadly, with a great uh, uh, disappointment, he said, I couldn't find anything wrong of it. It looks like a perfect book of Musar. There's nothing heretical about it. There's nothing messianic about it. It's great. And I think that Ramchal really hit it, hit it here. He, he really hit on, on the, the formula that he wrote a book which relates to practical devotion and answers a real need and uh, is something which is uh, consensual that writes in, in a language and based on the sages, on the Talmudic sages and so on, which is completely consensual and doesn't tread on any dangerous ground. And of course, if all these, as you mentioned, all these skills of writing and organization, 
And it worked, and the formula worked, and therefore, also in Hasidic circles, even those that are not especially fueled by Rabbi Kabbalah, even in New York, there's a, there's a Rebbe who teaches Mesilat Isharim on a regular basis, and certainly this is part of the, the core of the Jewish curriculum, this, this work. And it's a short work, it also helps. It's, it's easily assimilable, one can learn it quite quickly. Of course, it's, it's a mistake, because one has to learn it in depth, just like any other work of Ramchal, to, to look why he used this word, and why he put this in chapter 5, and not in chapter 10, and so on and so forth. And and so you're referring when you say chapter five, chapter ten to the um, to what's known as the thematic version of it, which is the version that, that most people read until quite recently, uh, which is just you know you know as you say chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, and it, it's, it's uh, didactic. It teaches it you know guides the reader through. Um, however, a new version of the of the or a different version, an earlier version, was discovered uh, when the um, when the libraries of of Russia that of, in Moscow were sort of thrown open after the fall of the Soviet Union. Um, and we discovered a new autograph manuscript of, of the Mesilla Tishari, which was completely different. Can you uh, describe this or, or tell us about this, perhaps? Well, Ramchal, because he was a playwright and because he was Italian, uh, wrote in dialogue, in dialogic form. There's other classical books of Italian Kabbalah that written in dialogical form, and one of Ramchal's classics, which is, was printed as that or not, in English, for some reason, it translated as the known heart. I've no idea why, but it's, it's not a bad translation. I mean, it's, it's not a bad title. It's not a good translation, but uh, <laughs> and it's a bit untranslable, the title, yes. The uh, the knowledge of understanding, I don't know how I would interpret it. So this book, that for not, is also a wonderful work, of, of the, but it's written in dialogical form. And we, of course, it's a very classical format, going all the way back to the Platonic dialogues. And Ramchal at the beginning wrote in this manner. And for some reason, he shifted to write, as you say, in a way, but without a dialogue. And uh, he, but in doing so, he also made it much more consensual. He took out the attacks on, uh, on excessive learning of Talmud that he put in the beginning. He made it much more, as you said, digestible for the Yeshiva world, really. Uh, the Yeshiva world, which was still then in its, uh, its infancy compared to what happened later. The Yeshiva world, of course, developed significantly more than 100 years later. But in some way, he, he laid the ground for it. Now, interesting thing is that one of the people who is not happy about Ramchal's Kabbalah, a great Lithuanian Kabbalist, he actually wrote against studying the dialogical version because he says that's exactly what Ramchal didn't want people to do. Because he wrote against people doing all kinds of causatory and scholastics, bilpul, uh, and, and wasting their time on it instead of focusing on, on how to perfect themselves and how to worship God in the best manner. And he says that the whole idea of people starting to say, ah, what's the difference between the dialogical version and the later version and do all kinds of pill pull around that is exactly counter, counterproductive in Ramchal's own, own, uh, for Ramchal's own purpose. Yes. But of course, for us as scholars, it's very interesting. Yeah, it is, it is very interesting, the, the, the differences. But, that, but I'm curious, I'd like to pick up on a comment you mentioned there that the Ramchal thought that, that what might be known today as pill pull or or Talmudic um, scholasticism or casuistry, you know, hair splitting, uh, which is which is what goes on so much in, in, in yeshiva nowadays, including the one that you you learned in, uh, yes. you know. Uh, so if he was hostile to that, that's very interesting that his books ended up as a core part of the curriculum, perhaps one of the only non-Talmudic parts of the whole Jewish corpus that is learned today in, uh, in shall we say, many of these Haredi yeshivot is in fact that the Mesilat the, Sharim and other works uh, of the Ramchal. So, uh, I mean... It seems interesting that someone who's hostile to that way of learning becomes a central figure for those who spend all their time doing precisely that. Yes, here's a big advantage of not staying with the dialogical, the first version. In the second version, these parts are taken out. That's A. And B, even other places where he says one should only learn Talmud about four hours a day, like Der Chochma, which was also published in Amsterdam in the same period. These books are not well known and they were published much later. So, um, it's interesting, there was a big fight in the Lithuanian Yeshiva world about Musar. There was what's called the Musar controversy, and many rabbis attacked Musar. One of the people, by the way, who defended Musar was Rabbi Cook, when he was still a rabbi in that part of the world, before he came to, J- to Jaffa, to, to Offman, Palestine. Uh, and he... Um, there's a story about one Yeshiva, they were under siege. The, the Musar was a bit like how Facebook conquered... Uh, the, the campuses by surrounding the campuses that didn't have Facebook with campuses that did, uh, as immortalized in the movie Sober Social Network. So uh, the I'm just saying because that's uh, that's where you come from on the same uh, the same gr- the same stamping grounds and uh, uh, the not come from but that's where you are at the moment. And uh, the so in a sense that's what happened in Lithuania. And one of these yeshivas that was under siege said, "Okay, fifteen minutes and that's it." 
And it became a ritual. I mean, when I was in Yeshiva, it was really completely ritualized. Uh, many people didn't even come. But even those who came, we studied Musa, not like a Mukhal fort that one should study it in depth, or like a Bisrael Sananda said, to study it with passion. It became by rote, in a sense. And uh, I, I remember uh, um, once trying to speak with one of the great leaders of the Lithuanian world, Rabbi Shach, and he says to me, now I have to study Musa. Uh, you know, <laughs> It's now seven uh, six thirty and six forty five is the beginning of a Muslim study. I, I will talk later. So, uh, but, but this is like a ritual in a sense uh, because he himself. Uh, it's true that he studied Musa and he did it with great devotion, but it wasn't. He didn't develop it in the way that Rabbi Sal Salanta developed it and so on. Uh, and recently, there's a certain revival of Musa, a slight revival of Musa. And I think it's fascinating because people, what I see is that the, I see with my own students, they gravitate so much towards the citizen because of its psychology, because of its passion, because of the music, because of the, 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 the kugel, the food, all kinds of stuff, uh, the happenings, the events, the, the charismatic figures. But Musa is a very powerful psychological method of, of, of change, of transformation, and of, or one could say, of, or, of auto-suggestion and uh, uh, there was a very important Israeli spiritual figure called Moshe Feldenkrais, a fascinating figure who developed a very interesting method, the Feldenkrais method, which many many people in the States practice it without even knowing it comes from Israel, more or less. Uh, and uh, he, he said once that, he said Musar is like Raja Yoga. He said it's like the forms, the more subtle forms of yoga that are about uh, psychological perfection. I think it was a very astute observation of his, but there's something about Musar which belongs in the, uh, the library of world mysticism and it's been missed in, in some way. But this is very interesting to me that, that you say that a critique of those who practice Musa could be that they haven't developed it or they haven't delved into it enough intellectually and, and sort of um, applied to it or to its texts the same level of analytical acuity that you would, let's say, to the Talmud or, or, the, or the same level of digging up its sources. Um, but one one might almost argue, I mean, which is occurring to me now, that such a thing is is almost against the very idea of Musa itself, which is... Musar, the advantage theor- theoretically of it, and and I think you mentioned this. One of the reasons it, the Musar Yisrael spreads so rapidly is that it is so practical, that it is so instructive. You open it, and it tells you here's the thing to do. So once you have an instruction manual, uh, you know if, if I have an instruction manual, I don't know to build a bed or something. I don't. It, the the thing that you don't do is to to delve deeply into it and ask questions. Sure, it, it seems to me that the advantage and the spread of Musar it doesn't require the same kind of digging that would uh, a piece of Talmud, a Talmud passage. But, but here you're saying to me that actually the Ramchal thought it did. That's explicit in the introduction. He says people spend their analytical powers on Talmud and philosophy, on science, and they're not doing it about the most important thing, which is the worship of God. So he says that you have to do things analytically uh, and you have to analyze your soul and you have to analyze what the Torah is really saying and, uh, and do these things conjointly. And this is how Rabbi Israel Salanta worked, and this is how his students worked, uh, including the, the person who I studied with, Rabbi Shlomo Volbe, and they all work like that. Uh, of course, there's always, every movement has its popularization, uh, just like with Hasidism, it's true. And, and many people take Musilat uh, Yisharim, as, as you say, like a manual, how to build a build a table or something. Uh, but, but people are not tables. Well, I mean, you've met different people than me, obviously. Um, <laughs> one of the things that's interesting also about Ramchal, I mean, he's, he's accepted, you know, religious Zionist authorities, Rav Kuk, Rav Hanazir, accepted among the yeshiva world, but he's also lauded by members of the of the Haskalah, specifically the secular Hebraic Haskalah, right? You have figures like, um, I think, Klausner and others who who saw the Ramchal's writings, and his, his writings were in the Hebrew, as, as sort of a new dawn. Why is Ramchal the start of something new that even a secular, masculine Hebraist might appreciate it? Well, this is not entirely my expertise, but what I would venture to say is that, first of all, he, he really did, in, in a sense, invent modern Hebrew. But his he, Hebrew is entirely modern. And uh, I'm not saying that he was the first one who wrote in modern Hebrew and there could have been precedents in Italy, but he did it in such a good way. And that's one thing. And the other is that in early Zionism, for instance, people like Bialik, who was a tremendous influence on, on Sholem also, on, on Jewish culture, on Israeli culture, one could say, even though it wasn't called Israel at the time, he really said we should we should look at Ramchal and we should take him as a paragon and so on and so forth. In, in Zionism, we were looking for forms of Hebrew culture that were not specifically uh, religious. And for someone like this who wrote poems and who wrote plays and who wrote on rhetoric, etc., who wrote also in, not secular, but veins which are less religious. And even in his religious vein, one can still appreciate the beauty of his language and, uh, and so on and so forth without necessarily buying into the whole uh, religious context. 
I think that's why Ronchal has also been become popular in, in secular circles in Israel. Of course, the, the, the secret is that it's, it's very it's very rare to find secular circles in Israel because everybody already in kindergarten is the father of Shabbat, there's the mother of Shabbat, we light candles, have challah, there's the whole... Uh, Compared, to, this is not real secularization. This is a, a, a relative secularization. So, uh, and therefore, also in the New Age, Ramchal, for some reason, has become very popular in the New Age, and one can understand it because he has this element of this personal revelation of challenging authority. Um, so, I think that even the New Age can, in some way, latch on to some of these uh, aspects of his life and thought. Interesting, and and I mean, I suppose this dovetails to something that you said before that I was. A little bit surprised at, um, which is that you had a thoroughly non-esoteric reading. In other words, there have been those who say, ah, Mr. Lati Sharim and, and many, many other uh, of the Ramchals, seemingly practical, seemingly psychological, uh, and, and you know, um, uh, non-mystical writings in the slightest, are actually suffused and shot through with mystical principles and mystical themes. And, and, and that th- this isn't your, your way of reading it at all. Your, uh, your section in your book about how to read the Mr. Lati Sharim, this is, you, you push this away. And, and so it seems that those, let's say, in the secular Hebraic circles who want to adopt the Ramchal also view his plays and also view his early writings in, in the same way, uh, in a way that isn't it, it, a non-conspiratorial way of viewing the Ramchal. In other words, he's not trying to put Kabbalah in everything. And he's not, you know, he had sides to him which were just creative writing. And then and you say, you know, he had this whole Mesida Tisharim project which is simply, you know, or not simply, but a, a way of, um, you know, writing about ethics and writing about self-improvement non-Kabbalistically. Am I right in saying this is of a piece? This is a way of reading the Ramchal that, to a certain degree, silos off parts of his writing from his grand Kabbalistic uh, endeavor. Yes, I think I think the two methodological assumptions there. Before that, I'll just say one thing about the plays. There is an early play of his, Migdalos, which is certainly a Kabbalistic allegory. Uh, but when he writes his later play, Le Shirim Tila, that's a play about politics. It's a bit like uh, uh, The Crucible by Arthur Miller. It's about, it's about his story. It's about persecution and how the... The masses become uh, before this is a hundred years before, hundred and fifty years before the theory of the masses in in political writing. How the masses can be caught up in some kind of crusade and uh, how one has to temper it with the voices of reason and so on and so forth. It's really uh, about political psychology, uh, not about Kabbalah at all. And the thing in methodologically, there's two things. One thing is I always try, which is I find it increasingly difficult in a sense to convey this training uh, to the university is. Uh, not to assume that a text says something. If a text wants to say something, it will say it. One can't assume it because a book was written by a Kabbalist, it's about Kabbalah. That's an assumption. One, one has to read the book as if one doesn't know who the writer is. And then build bottom up and see what the book is saying. And then you can compare it to other things that you wrote. Of course, he didn't forget that he was a Kabbalist when he wrote Mr. Lati Shari, but it's true. And the, the second rule is that one shouldn't, uh, I, I don't think, I mean, Leo Strauss and the whole way of reading things as, uh, as uh, uh, writing under persecution and hiding what you really want to say and saying something else, it's not in fashion today in any case. And I don't think it's, it's always wrong. It could, these things could happen. But one, again, one shouldn't assume it. One shouldn't uh, uh, approach a book with this um, lens. And part of it, I think, is also because the Kabbalah is so popular today, it has a tendency to eclipse other things, which is also a problem. And I'm saying that even though this is my livelihood and uh, the, the interest in Kabbalah. And the, the thing is that one has to understand the breadth of these people. That somebody also of Cook, people could be very, very broad and could have many lives uh, inside themselves and not necessarily do the same thing all the time. Um, even though uh, we could be interested only in Kabbalah, some of us, but they were not only interested in Kabbalah. You know, we had an episode on Leo Strauss uh, recently, but I suppose that your sympathies would be with those who say that, no, it's all, it, the burden of proof lies on those who try and say that there is an esoteric meaning to a text, rather than those who say there is not. Yes, yes. When, when Maimonides says in the beginning of a guide of, uh, of a perplexed that he is deliberately putting contradictions inside a book, one should look for them, because he said that that's what he's going to do. It doesn't mean that every single chapter in the guide is full of contradictions. It's also not true. But Strauss is certainly right when it comes to Maimonides, because he said so. But uh, I don't see a reason to assume that every writer, even the writers who lived under persecution, like Ramchal did at some point. But in uh, in Amsterdam, it's true, he couldn't write Kabbalah, but he wasn't being persecuted. So he, he, he and it's, right. it's true that he moved away from in the, uh, more radical or more controversial claims in the first version of Mesilati Shirim. So he was doing... He was making some political calculations, 
but it doesn't mean that one has to now eat all of it as if it's just a foil for something else. Okay, um, I, I one last sort of major question I wanted to ask, but I suppose this previous question has made me wary to ask it um, because you you present Ramchal as a man of, as you say, many lives and many um, sort of the capability to adopt many personas within his writing, uh, and not necessarily to you know he's uh, he's um, and to use Isaiah Berlin's metaphor, he's a uh, a fox rather than a hedgehog, meaning a man capable of of, of different talents. Um, but what I did want to ask is, you know, of the many streams that claim intellectual descent from the Ramchal, you have you know, the religious Zionists and the Hasidim and the Mitnagdim and the Musarniks and the Maskilim and, and you know, the secular Hebraists, etc. I mean, in your estimation, are any of these, do any of these streams have a better claim than the others? Is it possible to say, you know, the Ramchal, he really was more X than Y? Um, and, you know, yes, the members of, of Group Y claim him for various reasons, and, and that's okay. You know, there are elements of him, but, but really... We can see the Ramchal had his principal sympathies or his principal interest in this particular world or in this particular discipline. I mean, or, or can we just say, no, this is just up to reception history and, and, and nothing, uh, no claim of one group could be substantiated over the claims of another? Well, I'll say two things. On the one hand, yes, I would agree with what you say in the sense that uh, since he had so many aspects, each one of his groups took one aspect or two aspects of his writing and developed it. And, and that's part of his richness is that he enabled all of his developments. However, I will say one thing. I mean, we mentioned the dialectics. So I'll say something a bit Marxist. That there's also something that we, uh, um, that the legitimate ownership goes to those who do the production. And uh, the, the people who actually work on Ramchal are, are probably his best interpreters. And I think of somebody like Rabbi Yosef Spinner, who, who to give up Chaim Friedland there as his assistant, and later on his own right, in his own right, uh, devoted his life to publishing the, the manuscripts, to, to sorting out the manuscripts, the, the, the Ramachal from the non, the pseudo Ramachal, to commenting in great detail in studying with such analytic depth in publishing the writings of a circle, the writings of Vale, for instance. So I think because people like that have done this massive work, I think one should listen very carefully to what they say. Uh, even more than the university, because I think that the Ramchal University was ne- was neglected for many years. That's why I wrote the book, because we had one very important academic scholar of Ramchal, uh, Ishayahu Tishbi, uh, also a messianic figure. That's why he called himself uh, Tishbi. Yes, it wasn't his original name. Uh, the, like the prophet Elijah, who is going to crusade the Messiah. And uh, Tishbi did a tr- very impressive work on Ramchal, which is also uh, greatly appreciated in the Shiva world and the Haredi world. And uh, I think people like that, whether it's Tishbi or Rav Spinner, who've done this labor, uh, they have, in a certain sense, their ownership on, uh, on, we should listen more carefully to them than those who just take work that other people have done and write a commentary that turn Ramchal into Rav Kook or turn Ramchal into New Age or whatever. Uh, there's, there's always that danger, yes. Um, fair enough. I, by the way, that, that's a fascinating book someone should write one day called Pseudo Ramchal. And, uh, you know, all the texts that aren't Ramchal. Yes, one can take Rav Gordon's writings, for instance, like Klach Pitre Chochma, etc., and uh, and his prayers and so on, and one can really develop corpus, and that's something which still has to be written to write an uh, intellectual biography of Rav Gordon, even though his main claim to fame is that he exposed Ramachal and created the whole controversy by doing so. Fascinating. Um, I suppose one one final sort of um, semi-serious question to, to pose, which is that, uh, you know, if you had the opportunity to sit down tonight with Ramchal to dinner, um, what is it you'd be asking him? Or what, what subject would you broach? Well, it's a bit like asking if God can create a stone that he can't lift. In a sense, that somebody once asked me in class, what would Rav Cook say about certain stuff and such an event in Israel? Like, you know, it was a period in the life of our department but for various reasons we had these questions. Unfortunately, it's died out. But uh, And I said the definition of Rav Cook is somebody who lived from 1865 to 1935. If he would comment on an event in 1936, he would no longer be the Rav Cook. So, I, I'm not asking what Ramchal would say. I'm asking what you would want to ask him. Yes, but he would. But again, so if one assumes that one connect connects to souls like Ramchal connected to the soul of uh, of Adam and the soul of Abraham, then uh, maybe that would be uh, something uh, a profitable pursuit. But uh, I think that to, 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 to say it more seriously, uh, I think that for all that we know about hermeneutics and horizons. Somebody who lived in the 18th century is a different species in some way than people who live today in our technological world. I'm one of those who believe that technology has really profoundly transformed our being in the world. And uh, therefore, 
it's this this conversation has to remain imaginary in a sense, uh, unless of course one resorts to Kabbalistic techniques, and that's a that's a different story. Fair enough. What wasn't the answer I was hoping for, but but it's an answer that is is thought provoking because yeah, in in a way you're right. Uh, to imagine the Ramchal in the 21st century is to not anymore imagine him as the Ramchal. This has been a wonderfully enlightening conversation. Uh, Professor Jonathan Gubb, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast of Jewish Ideas. We very much appreciate having you here and um, we hope to see you again soon. Yeah, thank you very much and keep up the good work. This has been the podcast of Jewish Ideas by Torah in Motion, produced by Alicia Kelman and myself, JJ Kimchi. Edited and mixed by Alicia Kelman. You can stay up to date by subscribing in your favorite podcast app. To support more thoughtful Jewish content like this, please visit torahinmotion.org slash donate. 